I'm Marge Halperin. I uh, want to welcome you to the session. As, uh, as you could tell, uh, we had a, a wonderful lunch, engrossing. Let it run a little longer than it was scheduled, so we're going to play catch up a little this afternoon. We're going to cut this panel and the next one just a little bit shorter. And the break in between is not a leisurely break, so if you have anything you must do, do it and get back in the room so the next session can go. And we'll run uh, slightly longer till about 4.40, 4.45 instead of 4.30 today. So you can plan your afternoon. Uh, and we're going to just dive right in. Pull out your books and read our bios so you know who we are. And I won't repeat that. I'm an old journalist, and I'm, I'm going to cut and copy as I go. Uh, but I am Marge Helper, and I'm going to moderate this session on arts participation. We had a wonderful lead-in uh, with the last comment from Wendell Phillips, who was talking about the function of culture versus the participation. And I don't think we could have had a better setup for this conversation. Um, except, of course, I have one uh, that I'm going to use to set it up anyway. I, uh, in my role as a co-chair of Mayor Emanuel's uh, transition team for arts and culture, and now as vice chair of the new arts and culture advisory board, I want to frame this conversation quite literally from the title of the symposium, The Future of the City. We are in a remarkable position to have a conversation about the future of our city because change is everywhere and the people who can help change our city and make it even uh, a better arts and culture town are sitting in this room. So I can't resist the opportunity to tie some of the political direction with the arts and culture potential and that's what we hope to do today. Um, we, during the transition, we made uh, I would say there are two key points. One is that we addressed arts and culture as part of a citywide strategic plan. We are working on a, uh, are going to work on a culture, new cultural plan for the city. But broader than that, the transition plan and the transition process addressed arts and culture as part of the citywide strategic plan. We connected arts initiatives to the transportation uh, initiatives in terms of beautifying CTA stations, education, trying to put more arts uh, education into the longer school day that the mayor has now won. Public safety, putting arts programs into the summer youth agenda for the One Chicago Summer. So we, we started this in the transition, looking for ways to incorporate the arts into all aspects of life. And I think that as part of this administration's agenda, we're looking to embrace the intrinsic and the instrumental or um, uh, leverage the instrumental. We appreciate the quality of life, and I think we've all heard the new mayor talk about that quite a bit, um, the intrinsic value of the arts, but also the value of the arts with economic development, creating jobs, and cross-neighborhood fertilization, some of these real social fabric issues. If you haven't read the transition plan, you can find it at chicago2011.org. So that is kind of the basis for this conversation. What is the future of our city? What do we know about arts participation? Um, and what can we learn that will help us at this crucial time of our city when we're really looking to leverage uh, the, the assets of the arts uh, to advance our city and, and incorporate in some of the reform? Uh, I, I do want to say that I'm going to do my best to help uh, provide as much clear, direct specifics and bring the panelists uh, forward and ask you to do that as well. We tend to talk sometimes in insider terms, referring to this art, artist or that program, and perhaps everyone in the room doesn't know it. And since we have such diversity on the panel and you've all worked in so many different places, be sure and fill us all in on who it is and what it is that you're referencing exactly, or I will I'll, uh, ask the question further. So within this context, we're going to talk about the future of our city. And I want to start with the local boy, uh, who is Nick Rabkin, who has spent many years uh, working and advancing the arts and culture in this town. And when we talked at, ahead of time, uh, one of the things you said to me was, arts organizations are so focused on getting people through the turnstiles, putting the butts in seats. Uh, viewing their work almost as a retail product. And I, I see the, how that happens. I, I understand it. And in this economy, I think it must feel almost unavoidable if you're trying to keep an organization afloat. So what exactly is wrong with focusing on driving attendance as, a, as a, an approach to participation? Well, 
I don't think there's anything wrong with driving attendance, uh, and that going to the theater or going to concerts or uh, to museums is one dimension of, of participation in the world of the arts that can be pleasant, enjoyable, valuable, moving, um, and powerful. But it's only one. And there's an array of ways that people participate in the arts. I thought the opening, uh, opening talk this morning by John Holden uh, began to sort of create a, a structure for thinking about the variety of ways that people participate in the arts. Uh, and I, I liked uh, uh, Lisa, Lee's, Lisa Lee's comment, which uh, in, I, I, I take some pride because she's snitched it for me. Um, but, no wonder you but like it. <laughs> about, about the nouns and the verbs of art. Now, I have to say then, admit that I snitched it from somebody else. That's where all good ideas come from. Um, the nouns and the verbs of art, we, we think of the arts, and I think this is where the conversation about culture and art just a few minutes ago began to, began to uh, uh, what, what it was looking at was, we think of the arts as the nouns, um, the objects and performances that professional artists present um, for us to consume. But the arts are also the verbs. The arts are also the making of the work. The arts are also the active experience that one has in engaging the work, your own or somebody else's. And our arts system and arts policy has been heavily weighted towards supporting the institutions that produce the nouns and largely sort of avoiding the question of how do we approach the verbs. Um, and the place, you know, several people mentioned this this morning, the place to start with that. It's only the start, but it is absolutely the single most important place to start is arts education in the schools. Because all of the, I'll, I'll rely on the data now, all of the data says whatever kind of arts participation we're talking about, all of the data says that the single most powerful predictor of arts participation of all kinds is whether people had any access to arts education. The last 30 years, it has been driven out of our schools. And for poor kids, for the kids on those corners in Baltimore, um, those are the schools that are arts deserts. And we've got plenty of them here in Chicago. I uh, have, a, we have a couple of videos, we have several videos that we're going to use to sort of illustrate points here and, and there. Um, the, the first one I would like to bring up is um, from New York City. We have a couple from New York City. When you talk about introducing people to the arts, schools are definitely one place, but Maria has a lot of examples of how to involve people in, uh, actively in the arts in a lot of different places, largely by bringing the arts to where they are, um, creating a more um, accessible environment um, for arts as a part of a broad arts program. So I wanted to show this video. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, have seen this. Um, it's, uh, it combines culinary art and um, a, a bit of, quite a bit of performance art as well on a New York subway train. How's everyone doing? 
here's your first course. This is a fruit sashimi with crab roe caviar, bone marrow mayonnaise, and uh, spicy lime vinaigrette on top with some mustard greens. We can get a refill right here. We have course seats available. Are you guys interested? And it's now six course meal. I'm serious. Anybody want lunch? Michelle? You get the idea. If you want to see the whole meal, it's a four, six course meal, whatever, you can find that on, on YouTube. So Maria, you have worked a great deal with participatory arts, um, and what you said to me when we were preparing for this was, if you're an artist working in traditional ways, you have some catching up to do. What, what do you mean by that? Um, am I you are. on? I'm on, okay. Uh, I don't think that I, that I meant the uh, artists that are working in traditional ways have some catching up to do, so much as I think that there are many different ways that artists work, and not all artists are working or aspire to work in the traditional distribution systems that I think are primarily associated with the cultural sector. So the comment wasn't so much uh, that traditional artists need to catch up, so much as the systems that support culture in cities need to catch up with the ways that people are engaging and that artists, some artists, wish to participate with publics. And what I mean by that is that there is a need to think differently about what engagement is, I think, in ways that Nick has captured eloquently, where it's not just about passive consumption or um, audience participation, not to denigrate that, it's a way but there are these other active ways of engaging that often have to do with people um, discovering their own gifts, talents, uh, whether it's professional or not professional, that people are, uh, want to actively engage in the creative process. And I think that what needs to catch up are, one, the systems by which uh, I'm an urban planner, so I think about how venues and places and opportunities for uh, engagement happen, how we think about developing those, as well as how we think about the role of artists, not only as producers of artistic products, but as people who inspire and help others that are not professional artists take responsibility for their own creativity. Uh, and it's that um, more nuanced and complex way of thinking about the role of artists in society that I think is more consistent with how uh, we are increasingly behaving uh, as a society. And I think that's a positive uh, trend. The other area where I think one needs to catch up from a policy perspective is certainly in, in the uh, area of measurement and how we think about and talk about cultural participation, uh, why it matters, and how it can be measured alongside other things that are important, like housing, like work or employment, and education, health. Um, those are areas where there's work afoot, but we need to catch up. That is, I think, very relevant to Chicago at the moment. I heard a uh, little story recently from uh, someone who works in the arts in the Park District who says they are getting increasing pressure to measure uh, value, I hate to use the word value in this, but I believe that's what, how it's set up, to measure, to measure how much revenue they can bring in. Um, and the problem with this particular program is that adults pay for the programming, but kids don't. So the more kids in your class, the less revenue you bring in. And I fail to see how that advances an urban agenda, especially our agenda this summer. And I think measuring, uh, you need the money to run a program, whether you have a nonprofit or whether you're a government agency. But Alan, this is really your area of measurement. How do you measure this value in a way that it can be valued in this economy? Oh, boy. Um, <clears throat> uh. I think there are a lot of ways of understanding the va understanding value. We, we, we've had a lot of talk today about intrinsic value and instrumental value, and, you know, selling the arts by the pound and measuring, you know, we're, we're very good at taking attendance and we're very good at counting, you know, box office receipts, but we're really lousy at actually assessing 
how people are transformed. Um, but the irony is that when you ask people, <laughs> what was, you know, what was your reaction to that? How captivated were you? What was your emotional response? Uh, did it cause you to think? Uh, what questions did you leave with? Um, you know, uh, did you feel a bond with the rest of the audience? I mean, you can, um, you can ask those questions. I mean, I remember sitting in the Wallace Foundation office a few years ago with uh, Kevin McCarthy he had just presented the Gifts of the Muse report, the tough audience. You know, and we got to that wonderfully awkward moment at the end where he finished and they opened it up for questions and no one had a question. <laughs> and so foolishly I raised my hand and I said, isn't it ironic after 10 years of emphasis on measurable outcomes, you're telling us the real impact of the arts is intrinsic and can't be measured. <laughs> and Ed Pauley, the evaluation director at Wallace, you know, wheeled around in his chair and looked at me and very charitably said, you know, Alan, if you can describe something, you can measure it. And, I, and it took me like six months to figure out what he meant. Um, so we can, we can measure. And, and I, so, so I think there's impact, there's a whole set of issues around understanding impact. I mean, I wish that once a year, every year, every arts organization and board member and funder in Chicago would sit down and interview regular people about why they go. Just sit down and ask, what, 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 what value do you get out of this? Why do, you, why do you come out? How do you, you know, what's a successful experience? Because we make a lot of assumptions about what is meaningful to people, what value they get, what kinds of experiences they want, and we have to get back in touch with the community about what is meaningful in order to be relevant for decades to come. If anyone, I recently read the book Stumbling on Happiness. I don't know if anyone's ever read that, but basically you don't know what makes you happy. Yeah. Um, whatever you predict well doesn't. And there was an article in the paper the other day about the quiet cars on Metra, which they think everybody needs quiet cars and they would want them. But studies have been done with commuters, and if they set up a commuter and tell them to have conversations with the person next to them, or they tell them be quiet and don't talk to the person next to you, and then they rate their happiness afterward, they had a more pleasurable trip if they talked to people. Actually, we don't want quiet cars in the train. We just maybe don't want, um, you know, uh, hawkers selling us things or, or loud telephone conversations. But we want conversation. We want the interaction. Right. We want, right. in effect, live art. We don't just want to watch it on TV. We want that interaction. Um, Maria, your example from the LA Music Center is a good one where it combines participatory arts with uh, definitely some traditional art um, elements, but shows a way that you can make a very successful venue by looking at things differently. Do you want to talk a little bit about it and then we can look at the video? Yeah, and, and I should say Josephine Ramirez, who, who uh, birthed that program, is here. So hopefully you'll see a little bit of her uh, thoughts about it in the video. Um, I think it's a really uh, interesting and important example of several things and that have to do with the catching up piece. Uh, one, Los Angeles is a very demographically complex place. And I think that the Music Center, as is the case, and this is my opinion, as is the case uh, with many uh, big fine arts palaces around the country, is a place that is symbolic uh, about the importance of the arts, but it's often not as accessible as it would need to be to the, the population that it uh, seeks to serve. And the active arts program from my perch was a very interesting way and effective way of repurposing the campus of the Music Center to make it what its mission says it was supposed to be, which is a place to activate um, civic engagement and, and get people involved. The other thing that it does, I think, is uh, use that space that is a validating space to honor uh, amateur practice, and it's amateur not in the punitive way of talking about it, but non-professional practice mm -hmm. of people who want to engage actively. So I thought it was a brilliant example of how you can use um, this place as a validating entity for activity that is often denigrated because it's not 
uh, professional or it's not presented uh, much in the way that was talked about in the last panel when people talk about something is presented and it puts it in a different concept, context and give, gives it a different value. So um, it, it is a way of catching up. All right, let's take a look. This is what it's all about. It's just about moving and enjoying being around other people. There was a big circle and you sit there and you can just drum and it's the best stress reliever that I have ever come across. The Music Center is a place where people come to and feel welcome, not only if they're able to get inside, but if they're able to play outside. Something special has been happening in downtown Los Angeles. It's called Active Arts at the Music Center. Active Arts is changing the way performing arts organizations across the country are connecting with their surrounding communities. It's one thing to present world-class productions to a paying audience inside the walls of a performing arts center. Active Arts is doing something else entirely, igniting the creative spark in everyone. With low-cost or no-cost events that take place beyond the four walls of the theaters. It feels like there are a bunch of folks from all different parts of the city coming together with essentially a bunch of strangers, but you're all there together to enjoy the arts, enjoy the performing arts. Well, this pro program promotes actively engaging. I feel like I'm really part of a bigger thing called the L.A. music scene. One thing that we're looking at um, in the city of Chicago and elsewhere, we're not the only ones, is this idea of cultural hubs. That is one idea that came out pretty um, well formed from the transition process, where um, just like the downtown theater district, looking where there is a concentration of arts activity uh, and then supporting that to become a destination, not only for tourists or others, but for people from other communities because we tend to be a city of neighborhoods which means that we all have our great cultures but it also means we tend to stay within our own so to bring people from one community to another um, but uh, we've done that in some ways it's been done passively sometimes in the neighborhoods but how would you from the experience you have about participatory arts when we talk about um, the uptown music district for instance it's not just about enhancing the music palaces and waiting for people to come and see a show um, in your world, there probably are more um, direct ways for the city to manage a more participatory community. What, what would be some of those things? Um, one concept that I'm writing about now is something I call the cultural kitchen. And it builds on this premise that uh, diversity is part of cultural vitality. And in theory, um, from my perch, a world-class city is one that has these common spaces where people can bring what they have to offer, to share in the communal space. But you can't really do that if you don't have a place to prepare something to bring. And that's what I think of as the cultural kitchen. And it's a question when you think about neighborhoods and communities and the amenities that are uh, necessary that are uh, not negotiable, if you, if you will. Um, do those communities have the places where they can create the culture, that authentic culture, that they can share um, with others? So the cultural kitchens in, in communities look many different ways. I think um, Wendell was talking about the social aid and pleasure clubs in New Orleans. And certainly those are examples of cultural kitchens where culture is made. Sometimes it's a different kind of a community center. Sometimes it is uh, explicitly an arts place. Uh, often it's not. But I think that those are those seminal places where people create the culture from which art flows that then give communities and cities their sense of place, that authenticity. Um, that I think is, is a desirable characteristic. So in terms of how cities can promote that, I suppose I would change the question to how would one promote this notion of cultural kitchens, mm -hmm. right? And in different communities, it'll look different ways because 
uh, at their best, I think, you build from what's organic. Um, figuring out what the cultural kitchens are, I think, is an important mm -hmm. first step, or if they exist in communities. I would suggest that one example uh, that we have in Chicago is the Old Town School of Folk Music, um, where uh, I think a lot of great art happens and a lot of um, musicians, they can come there to learn, but they, can also, they also go out from there um, with their own art and bring it to other parts of the city. And Nick, this is where you talk a lot about teaching artists and their role in generating a broader participation in the art. So you well, you know, I'm just a, out of curiosity, I've seen this exercise done once before. If you know what a teaching artist is, raise your hand. Good. That's more than in most groups. It's a relief, too. Um, the last time I saw somebody ask that question was at the, the, three art, the annual Three Arts Awards event at the MCA several months ago. It was the first year that awards were given to teaching artists as a separate category. Um, an important step forward that teaching artists who generally fail to get recognized in competitions with, you know, for visual art or classical music or acting and so forth get recognized. Teaching artists, actually, um, the first teaching artists in America were hired here in Chicago by Jane Addams uh, at Hull House uh, to, uh, uh, to teach, the arts, uh, teach in the arts program there. And as a matter of fact, um, uh, Benny Goodman took his first clarinet lessons there, and uh, since Wendell mentioned Louis Armstrong, I'll mention that Louis Armstrong took his first cornet lessons at the home for Negro waifs in New Orleans, um, where there was a band instructor, unnamed, although he did once appear on television with his first formal uh, teach, uh, trumpet teacher, a guy named Peter Davis. So there are real people who do this work. Um, and it's really important work. Are we going to We are. We can see, see one thing? right now. I want to show you one of the winners of the Three Arts Award for Teaching Artists this year. I'll give you a bit of an idea of what they do, and in this case, um, what they do with kids in Chicago public schools. Jessica Hudson. I'm a theater maker and a teaching artist. Teaching artist, artistry feeds me. Um, it feeds my, my work. And this is my focus right now, and, and this is my 10th year um, doing teaching artist work. And, and I'm so interested in that feeding, that cyclical nature of teaching artist, artist work and my artist work. They're both called work. The work I, I do to, to make money, the work I do to, um, to make my art, and yet they have to feed, they have to feed each other. And there's, um, there's so much room for that, I think, that, that we need to I need to tap into that personally, and we as a field need to tap into that more, that, that place for putting your own work into the classroom. This idea of, of flight um, is fascinating to me. The word, of course, can go many ways. It's the first project that I really explicitly put some content that I'm, I'm also researching in my own work. That, that notion of, of hope and engineering and uh, this idea of these people who are standing on the ground and looking up and thinking, I want to go there. I want to see the world from that point of view. And what better concept that's broad enough but specific enough flight to give to kids to, to work with. We designed wings and we built choreography and we made music and then we took all of that and put it in front of the public. The kids were being witnessed in a really positive manner by friends and family but also by total strangers and for an elementary school age student that is one of the most, um, it's just one of the biggest gifts you can, you can give them. Alan, you talked about the same concept in terms of people as culture makers and not just culture consumers. Again, we're not talking about one model over another, but we're talking about the variety of models. Um, so uh, part of that is from your research perspective about how to just grow the audience and get uh, many more people engaged. What is it about people, how do you engage people as culture makers when they may or may not see themselves as creative types. Yeah. Um, God, I wish I knew that. Um, um, ecological thinking is what I call it. E ecological thinking, um, which is 
uh, an ability to, uh, an awareness and curiosity about understanding your place in the larger environment of art, culture, and creativity. And I think this is perhaps one of the most difficult things, and not just arts administrators, but artists and funders, um, this is so challenging. So the first thing we need is an accurate picture of the ecology. <laughs> and we are working on that. The, the, the NEA does a, a great job, and there's some very exciting changes coming to the Survey of Public Participation in the Arts, and there are other, um, other communities. Um, I just presented a, a study in Philadelphia last week uh, cultural engagement index. Um, Ontario is about to release a new, you know, study. So we're making f progress in um, understanding how to articulate, you know, the environment. And and yes, we're starting to ask people um, about the whole landscape of inventive forms of participation, curatorial forms of participation, uh, people collecting collecting art, online forms of participation, and. You know, it's a whole different picture when you start changing the quest, you know, the questions. So ecological thinking requires this picture, but it, it requires a certain selflessness, I think. And we are all naturally self-interested, and, and I understand and respect that. Um, but you know, there, there are two things that will lead to change. One is the imminent threat of death. Uh, and the other is a, a, a profound change in your self-concept that would lead you to understand you have a new role to play in the community. And I, I present these research results, and to be honest with you, I just see a lot of blank stares from arts administrators when I start talking about the ecology. You know, so if you're a dance company, why should you care that the dominant form of dance participation in our culture now is watching competitions on television? Now, what does that mean? And, and there, are, you know, there are no easy answers. If you're a museum, why would you care what's hanging on the walls in people's kitchens? And until we come to grasp, or you know, whose job is it to look across the portfolio of organizations and conceptualize new programs to get hundreds of thousands of people engaged in creative expression. Whose job is it? Um, I would venture to say it won't happen at the NEA, as much as I admire the NEA, and it won't happen uh, among the associations of professional arts organizations. Where it is happening is in the work of the kinds of artists who were outside at the LA Music Center and are inside in Chicago public schools. Um, those are the people, those are the artists who are inventing the new kinds of participation that I think so many people are yearning for in the arts. There's a hunger for that. Um, I think that what the SPPA, Alan referred to the SPPA, it's a long-term series of s surveys that the NEA has conducted of public participation in the arts that have shown that the proportion of American adults who are walking through those turnstiles is shrinking over time. It was never a majority of the American people, though. Let's remember that. It was always a minority. We have to start thinking about that majority that has never gone through the turnstiles and probably won't. What are they hungry for? And how do we feed them what they're looking for? I would argue that actually it's people like Jessica Hudson who are figuring it out. Right. And it's actually not an academic exercise for them. Right. It's right. an artistic exercise. It's a, it's, it, I'd like to, we have another video that shows an example that I'm uh, really fond of because it's this intersection a little bit of news and politics and art, which I personally love. I don't know how many of you have already seen or heard about this uh, story, but uh, Newsweek magazine uh, 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 some weeks ago, months ago, declared Grand Rapids, Michigan, one of 10 uh, declining cities in the country. It made them very angry. They didn't like being um, dismissed that way. And they wanted to communicate in some bold way that they are still alive and kicking and actually a pretty fun town. And they did this by going to art. 
but while you will see professional artists in the video, whether you see it in this portion or not, but they're there, the symphony is there, and they're well represented, but you see, what you mostly see are everyday people from Grand Rapids who are embracing art as a way to communicate with Newsweek and anyone else who thinks Grand Rapids is a dead city. Dancing in the gym, you both kicked off your shoes. Man, I dig those rhythm and blues. I was a lonely teenage punk and buck with a pink carnation and a pickup truck. Oh, but I knew I was out of luck the day the music died. I started singing. stole his thorny crown the courtroom was adjourned no verdict was returned yeah my letter read a book on Marx a quartet but it goes on and on and I don't think there was a person uh, who could uh, get up and move around in Grand Rapids that day who isn't in this video <laughs> It's the most participatory art to ever hit Grand Rapids, I am certain of that fact. Um, and the mayor and everyone else is in it. And I just think um, the potential to engage uh, a community around art is, you know, it's what drives us all on some level, yeah. Alan. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the whole industry is um, figuring out how to monetize digital content, you know. It, it's yeah, that such, plus two. It, it, it's such a challenge. The scale of impact is staggering, um, but you know, my concern is that in 10, 10 or 15 years, millions of Americans will be going to movie theaters for their music, dance, opera, opera. and our cultural facilities will be dark. Uh, in terms of public participation, that would be a great outcome, because millions more people will be experiencing the arts, but it won't be such a happy outcome for some arts programs. So we need to figure out, um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly astounded. I had a conversation with the artistic director of a major theater company last week, and she said, Ellen, what is ecological thinking? And I said, you know, imagine on Monday nights you dropped a screen in one of your three theaters and invited people to come on down and watch The Wire, or Mad Men, or Glee, heaven forbid. No. <laughs> it's drama. And this is how America experiences drama, and we have to make connections with people about where they, how they experience art. So I would love to see arts, you know, a whole new kind of arts facility that doesn't exist yet where people gather socially for digital experiences. You know, because that train has left the station. It's, it's starting, and if we don't figure it out, a, a, a very wealthy multiplex chain operator will figure it out for us and run away with the market. 
But it's about a balance, isn't it? Marie, you've talked about arts um, institutions as palaces that need to be opened up in some ways. Um, and we don't intend to replace the fabulous arts institutions that we have. Of course not. I would never be accused of institution bashing. <laughs> and, and I was not accusing you of that. You bite the hand that feeds me, but um, I think, you know, artistic excellence as a reason to be has its limitations. And that on some level, excellence has been conflated with creativity and programming. And that we really need to rethink how to make programs, you know, how to conceptualize creative programs collaboratively as a community and come out of our corner because that is truly what will propel, I think, this you know, community to its next level. Well, that's a, that's a very articulate way um, to, to hit on your message. And I, I, you know, I think the conflict in our city and in a lot of places is that part of the pride of art in Chicago is the whole storefront scene, um, that it, anybody with a creative vision can get a cheap space and put on plays, open a gallery, use it, create a studio. Um, our, our space, well, um, from a regulation standpoint, could use more flexibility. It still is quite flexible, and there are opportunities that abound. And therefore, we have more theater companies than any other city in the country. Um, and uh, proliferate art, uh, art galleries, and the scene happens everywhere. Pilsen is alive with studios because it's so easy to set up your own. So what you're, you're challenging that model in a really interesting way. Again, not an either or. I think we're all, I hope we're all really clear on that. But it's how do you, this is the selflessness that you were talking about earlier. So Maria, how do you take this landscape that we have in Chicago and uh, make it deeper, broader, and more participatory? How do we make that shift? I mean, that's a big question. Um, I think that part of the answer lies in recognizing that there are different kinds of um, cultural participation, art experiences, and paths that artists choose. Um, so what will get any city stuck is a reliance on a narrow way of thinking about what the arts should look like, where they should happen, and uh, a reliance on what currently flies as the most important validation mechanisms, right. which don't account for um, the expression of people who are, may not be professional artists or uh, not fully account for artists who may choose to work in ways that are apart from the traditional cultural system that is heavy on the presentation of professional arts. So when you think about artists, for example, that are working at the intersection of arts and community development, or arts and health, or teaching artists, arts and education, um, the validation mechanisms that hold up those kinds of practices as things that are important and have value, in many instances, they don't exist. I think in the instance of the teaching artists, there's an infrastructure that's beginning to emerge that does honor that particular path uh, uh, and way of, of, of doing uh, work uh, that contributes in real ways uh, to people's lives. But in many instances, those other intersections are not at the point where that validation system exists. Mm -hmm. And it's a validation system that's more complicated than what currently exists in the arts world because it is at the intersection. So it's, it's, it's simple to put on a show, watch how many people come, look at your reviews and see whether that's successful. That's, that's one way of thinking about it that is a little less complicated mm -hmm. than the artist who's working at the intersection of arts and health. Mm -hmm. where part of the validation would ideally be from the health community. 
um, or the artist who's working at the intersection of arts and community development, where surely there are aesthetic aspirations and there are aspirations beyond those aesthetic uh, intentions. Uh, so I think it's, it's that confluence which um, from my perch, it, it happens to be what I'm interested in the most right now as a, as a planner. And I should just say, um, one of the conversations I've had recently, which was really thought provoking for me, I was talking with a colleague and friend who's a working planner in Northern California. And we were talking about some of the writing I was doing. She's very familiar with the work. And not in any mean-spirited or uh, confrontational way, she asked me, she said, you know, Maria, I'm working with infrastructures that are crumbling, uh, cities that are literally, physically falling apart. How would I make the case for the arts in that environment? And the, rea the reality is that, uh, from my perspective, I think that the creative community has a lot to offer. Um, but it often isn't framed that way. The, the framing is that of a supplicant that is upset because budgets are being slashed. And another framing could be here is part of a solution. And that's not to diminish the arts to an instrumental function, but it is to take on the arts as um, responsible citizens and in an all hands on decks moment, um, what does the arts community bring to the table? Which is very different from I'm offended or I'm upset because I'm being slashed. It's a, it's a different kind of framing and posture. And it may not be for everybody, but we are in a particular moment where that, to me, I mean, from my perch as a planner, is, is the most interesting work. It seems like economists are talking in every sector about the new normal um, in terms of home ownership, in terms of jobs, in terms of career trajectory. And in a lot of ways, I think what we're talking about here on this panel is the new normal uh, for the arts world. You were going to say? Yeah, yeah I, I think in a certain sense, it's fair to say that the arts have many of the same problems that, that David Simon described a little while ago that journalism's got that in a certain sense, the old system is badly broken. It's not working very well, and it's working for fewer and fewer people, both the consumers and the producers. Um, and that the system really has to rethink and reinvent itself in fundamental ways. And I suspect that the by what I mean by fundamental ways is that instead of isolating the arts as we we've really developed a system that isolates the, art from, the arts from everyday life. That we really need a system that weaves the arts into everyday life. That really is what Jane Addams was talking about 120 years ago when she founded Hull House. And that's what teaching artists do in Chicago schools and what the, the, music, the music center in LA was doing with that uh, uh, Arts Alive program. That's the kind of direction we have to think about. But I, I want to caution that it's not it's not a free lunch. Artists have to make a living too. It costs, it costs them time and trouble and toil and sweat and tears to do that kind of work. And frankly, most teaching artists like Jessica make what that pianist makes in the tip jar in New Orleans. It's not a good situation. And, and teachers overall, I would like to add, not just those who teach art. Absolutely. We, we, because our schedule is being changed around a little bit, we're going to go just to 310 for this session. If there are any questions, though, I would love to take them. There's one way in the back. Yep. Wait a minute. Oh, oh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Barbara. Lee will give you a microphone. Come on down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Um, I had a couple of comments that might turn into a question. Doesn't work. And I Speak will be right into it. speaking right into the mic. Much better, isn't that? First of all, um, Glee is okay, right? Um, two things. Grand Rapids, in addition to that great video, um, is doing really interesting things that involve participation in even a more concrete way. Their art prize has thousands and thousands of everyday Americans spending two weeks walking around the town 
talking about art. It's an amazing, amazing experience, much more concrete even than, than that. And the other thing that Grand Rapids has been doing lately that's really interesting is that all of their, many of their corporations who are innovators like Steelcase and Herman Miller and Wolverine got together and decided we need to do something collaboratively in our downtown and they created a whole design center. And all of the design departments of these major corporations, global corporations, are working together in the same facility in the downtown area and collaborating. I mean, that's a really interesting, innovative idea that we can do in Chicago. Um, and then the only other thing, two other things I wanted to point out that were generated by this conversation is that there are very few artists here in the room, which is a shame. I know there's a number of people who are hybrid artists that Maria talks about who have professions as administrators and educators as well as being artists, but I don't know how many are actually just artists in different ways. Elf is many here. are both. And right? they should be part of these gatherings, they should be part of community development, economic development, and neighborhood associations because they do bring a different perspective than the academic and the policy perspective as practitioners. And the last thing I want to say is it would be often awesome if our city could develop a culture of yes. Because a lot of the stuff we talk about, whether people want to open a gallery in their apartment or if they want to pioneer um, an industrial building as an art center, they're shut down because the city says no. Or people who want to fund a project are shut down because a funder says, you know what, you haven't been around long enough or you're not filling out this form right. So if there's a way to create a culture of yes for these kinds of creative practices, it would make a huge difference for all the other kind of work that we're trying to do here. Thanks for letting me have a little soapbox. I, I would like to say that from the regulatory point of view, I think the new administration definitely has a beat on what's needed um, for the arts businesses as well as basically any other small businesses trying to do something entrepreneurial in this town and in this economy. We have another question right there. I just wanted to echo sort of the last two points, sure. Maria and Nick, and then Barbara made, which is that often artists are sort of the afterthought at the table, and their expertise is so considered less than the experts who are invited to, into the room. And I think that that's one thing we could work on in the city of Chicago, that at every level, that our um, experience our knowledge base, our practice base, is as relevant, is as expert as economists, as zoning practitioners, as urban planners, and that we should be there from the beginning, not as an add-on when we want to have the entertainment and the cultural, multicultural piece and the um, sort of the fun stuff uh, we're brought in at, that, at the end but we need to be there from the beginning. Wow. Didn't hear. Thank you. Another question up front here? I had a question here. Um, and that is, oh, Rick, I'm sorry. You, you raised the question about um, how can you create programs uh, in the cultural community, uh, meaningful programs. And I would submit to you that I think the very first start is to, to remove the um, divisive labeling and, and, and the separation in the general and the broader cultural community. I think that if you do that, then you create an environment where you have uh, an abundance of uh, creativity that could evolve and emerge in creating many, many, many meaningful programs. And, and in the session we had earlier, they talked about job creation. When you remove those separatism labels, and you put everything sort of under one umbrella, say for, un for the sake of this discussion, under tourism. People in, under the umbrella of tourism who create uh, businesses and items to sell to tourists who come to places. People who can create businesses for tourism. Those people consider themselves artists. I'm a founder of, the, of a black labor history museum. I consider myself an artist. I'm not a visual artist but I consider myself an artist. And so I would say that that's the first step in, in removing those labels because you, you separate people, you isolate people. 
if you remove those labels, I think you, you provide an opportunity for a larger group to come together and work together and do some amazing things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are close to our end of our time, but if you can be quick. Just quickly, I had a question more. for Alan um, in terms of barrier to participation. You were talking about we need to create new types of venues for um, more media access or uh, for the public, the populist, to attend events. I think about the Met, I come from New York, and the Metropolitan Opera has done HD projections in, you know, if you can't go to the Opera House, then we'll bring the opera to you. And so I just wanted to know from your perspective what the barrier to participation is. Well, I think in general we don't pay nearly enough attention to setting, the importance of setting in arts experiences. And we take for granted the, the, the settings where things happen because they're convenient and they're acoustically perfect and there are good dressing rooms and, you know. But from what I see, I see the public responding more and more to unusual settings that somehow connect to the work. So uh, an orchestra um, performing at, at, a, at an old warehouse at midnight um, and doing works that are appropriate for that setting and tapping into a, a demand that they never knew existed. So. I see a lot of arts groups um, basically po polishing, oh, it's going to sound, polishing um, their jewels um, and not thinking <laughs> about what is the next product line in a different setting that will engage a different public. So, Specifically, I think we need to work out venues. You know, where, where can people go? Um, you know, at 2 o'clock you can watch the dance company. At 4 o'clock you can see an opera. At 6 o'clock you can see a great theater company. And at 10 o'clock you can see a live performance. You know, and it's going to blur. And we need to create those spaces um, where the expected behavior is to walk up to a perfect stranger and say, what did you think of that? you know, and talk about the art and, and, and those facilities, you know, I mean, the democratization of the arts is inevitable, it's happening, it's a sort of the big theme I'm hearing today. Mm -hmm. And the decentralization of the infrastructure is the, is the you know, the, the effect of that. And it, it's only going to continue, I think. Do I have time That'd to make one more comment? We have, actually, you get one more, but you have to answer the rapid fire question. <laughs> we have the rapid fire round so we can stay on, on target here. So my final question, to go back to the beginning of our session and our theme of the future of our city, what's the one thing in one to two sentences that the city of Chicago and Mary Emanuel should do right now to help leverage the value of arts and culture in this city and increase participation? Okay, two sentences. The first sentence is um, more arts in the schools, period. Um, they can't be cut in this environment. They're more important now than ever. Second sentence. Wendell used the word voice upstairs, and I'll spend 45 minutes with anybody else who wants to talk about it. But I think you can't talk about democracy and the arts without talking about voice. And the homemade arts, as, as John referred to them this morning, are all about our voices, not just professional artists' voices, all of our voices. And actually, it's worth mentioning that that's really what The Wire and Treme are about, too. They're about all of our stories. That's what dem democratic culture is. Maria, what's the one thing we should do right now? Two things. Uh, all right, then. <laughs> one is recognize that everyone has a creative seed uh, and find the ways to nurture that, whether they go on to become professional creators or not. That creativity is something that a responsible city does, one. And two, recognize in a more sophisticated and uh, complex way the plausible contributions that artists can make, not only in the cultural realm, but in the, those other realms where there are very natural intersections. 
in sciences, in education, in health, in community development, recognize the plausibility of those contributions, which I think are untapped. Those are two sides of the same, co same coin in a lot of ways. Those are very good. Alan? Ecological thinking. All right, then. <laughs> I think every human being has a creative voice of intrinsic worth, and it is every community's obligation to awaken that voice. All right. Thank you so much. Nice. Thanks to our panelists.